All right. Well, guys, um, Zach, thanks for coming on to our, our little podcast here. Um, today, we're just going to kind of go over a few things, some of the things that you're working on. Uh, I guess some of the history maybe people don't know about how we've all been working together for over a decade together. We can put some good stories in there. And then, you know, some uh, current topic stuff in, in the information security or geopolitics or whatever we want to cover today. And maybe some uh, questions and answers for, or, you know, fielding some email support questions from uh, people that we hadn't responded to from the last episode. So just so everybody knows, you've got Daniel Clemens here from Shadow Dragon. And with Shadow Dragon, we provide collection tools and... Uh, for investigators and analysts, um, those those tools integrate into a few different platforms out there: Link Analysis, Multego stuff, I two um, case where a few a few different different platforms, and then we have a, a fairly large persistent monitoring infrastructure out there for for tailored monitoring and, and collection. So, um, my background is is primarily in a lot of different things, you know, with penetration testing and forensics and deep dives. And Zach Payton and Brian Dykstra have been along a lot of those um, adventures with me over the years. I'd say I'd say going back almost 15 years total, but uh, the three of us working together the last decade. So um, Zachary Payton, um, I'm not going to steal your thunder, but... Uh, Zach's, Zach's, Zach was born in, into InfoSec probably about the same time I was in the late 90s, you know, doing exploit development, exploit R&D, pen testing, um, you know, large-scale enterprise networking, um, teaching. Zach, you, you've got stuff to throw in there. I think we should do a Bane thing on that. <clears throat> yeah. He's born yeah, exactly. into InfoSec. InfoSec you only, analysis. You only, you only joined InfoSec. <laughs> I have never seen anything but InfoSec. I eat InfoSec for breakfast. <laughs> it's the early 80s. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got to throw that that little uh, troll in there a little bit, right? Yeah. Shout out. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for having me. I really hope that we get to uh, cover the time that you almost accidentally robbed some people in Japan. We're going to tell stories. Oh man, we we will have to. I'm gonna let you lead on that. How I accidentally robbed somebody in Japan eight, uh, ten years ago. I guess we were over there in Japan almost exactly ten years ago, coming up in or maybe eleven years ago, coming up in February. Uh, you, myself, Alan Harper, and a few other. I do the, the Japan trip that I got screwed out of. I want to just put that on the record. Yeah, you did get screwed out of that Japan trip because you had to go respond to some Chicom stuff. So, yeah. Um. But yeah, uh, I'll let you tell that story, Zach, because it, we it, it, that? it's it's all about perception, right? <laughs> We've been in Japan for three weeks. We've been commuting on the train every day. And, you know, Japan is, you know, in public at least, a pretty stoic culture. And so, you know, no one would really engage with us until about our third week. It was a Friday night. We've been working, I don't know, 14 hours or come back late. And these two younger kids that were wearing like, you know, gangster style New York bling were kind of animated, obviously a little buzzed. And uh, they came up to us. And, you know, Dan's super frisky and engaging and social and and they were like america fuck yeah and dan was like japan fuck yeah well uh, also I, i'll also interject here these were the only guys like after after those three weeks were kind of like man people don't have enough you know like there's not enough expression like no one's smiling there's not enough uh you know like color you know like because we're going out past shinjuku and all that you know and um so my thought was like man these guys look cool What's up? So he starts engaging with them. And, you know, the conversation kind of goes a little bit like this. He's like, uh, you know, and, and Dan ran packet ninjas for a long time, too. He's got like an interest in uh, ninjutsu and martial arts, especially in the Japanese store. And uh, so Dan's conversation progresses something like, that's really cool bling, like nice bling. Yeah, fuck yeah. 
And then his very next question is, do you guys know martial arts? And he does this animated hand motion, you know? And both of them, they look at each other really quick. They look at Dan, they look at Alan Harper, who's the US Marine. They look at Kevin Wood, who's, you know, a pretty big dude, awesome guy. Yeah, and they're both wearing like jet black, big trench coats and crap. And then me, and I'm like almost 6'4", and it's just like, we're pretty imposing, you know, for, for two Japanese young men. And they look at all of us, they look back at Dan, they look down at their bling, and they both turn around and take off running. Right, yeah, and this is the last train of the day, by the way. So Dan's like, well, where are you guys going? And all of us are staying behind him, just laughing, laughing. And, and I was like, Dan, do you understand what just happened? Like, you basically said to them, like, nice bling, want to fight. And it was right. all lost in translation. It was totally meant well, but it could have ended They'd have just thrown down that bling like we'd have been in charge of the <laughs> Yeah. To this day, I still always give damn. You know, you know like, you, like, I never know how tone deaf I might be on a given day, so. But on other times, you're, like, right on, like, the Moon Man story. That, it's a real quick segue. We were in Shinjuku, and there, there's a bunch of, uh, I, I, I don't know what, like, West Africans that are just there and, and on the corner, you know, kind of. And, and they'll just ask you, and we would go out, you know, fairly frequently. Dan and I were like the two young guys on the crew and we'd go out. And every time we go out, they would follow us for like half a block and they'd be like, what do you want? You want drugs? You want girls? You want clubs? Like, right, right. And they would go on for like five or six blocks, I know. And, and finally, and then we'd get to the next yeah. block and there'd be another one and he'd do it again. <laughs> and Dan and I would just get frustrated because we were just enjoying having conversation and exploring Japan and especially Tokyo, Shinjuku area. And, uh, Finally, I don't know, maybe after about the third week, Dan just gets tired of it and he gets in the guy's face and he's like, I, oh yeah, man. He's like, I bet you I can get you something that you can't get. And the guy's like, I can get anything. What do you, what do you, what do you? And he's like, I can get you tickets to the moon, man. And the guy's like, man, get out of here with that. And so and then, then I step up, I keep I getting still- in his face. I keep getting like closer and closer. And he's like, people are walking by the guy and he's and losing he's sales. Right. He's done with Dan. And Dan keeps jumping in between him and whoever he's trying to holler at. He's like, yo, what you want? What you want? You want tickets to the moon? You want tickets to the moon? I got you tickets to the moon. You want, you want, you want? And the guy finally was just like, all right, man, get on out of here. And the next night we come out. You're right. We get off the train. You know, yeah. They just look at him and they'd be like, what's up, moon man? Yeah, yeah. For five and blocks, every single one of those dudes was like, what's up, moon man? And like for it the rest of the trip. Really- way of like just like flipping the tactic on its head to like it was great the- it was great we never got guy like, those guys never talked to us again other than like what's up moon man nobody nobody bothered us after that no but they do what's up moon man yeah like, mug- it was it was a good <laughs> flip on on you know yeah that was really fun it was awesome that was good well zach e- we, uh, you've been working on some crazy stuff for the last five or six years, which is pretty kind of bleeding edge. And I was wondering if you could kind of, kind of tell us about those solutions, what, what those things are solving for the analysts that you're targeting. Um, you know, what, what are the main three problems kind of that, that, that they, their, your solutions are solving and, um, kind of let's let's highlight some of the stuff that you got going on because it's pretty bleeding edge it's a little advanced even kind of like the way that you're doing it yeah know. absolutely so it, it helps to start with the history so i was one of the founding <laughs> team members for riot games which makes league of legends one of the largest played video games on the planet and so we had just massive data collection issues is kind of where it started where we were running you know our own worldwide fiber optic backbone and you know multiple tens of data centers and offices all over the world and we needed to basically figure out clever ways to to do analysis on like very large streams of data in, in real time and so um my, my business partner and i we founded uh, westward ai as a result of our experiences kind of working at, at riot games and dealing with how do you do security analytics at scale um and triage quickly mm-hmm. so, um you know, a lot of what we did early on was kind of just making, well, to this day, it's, it's all just a series of mistakes and experimentation and kind of iteration and figuring out what works and doesn't work. Uh, and so a lot of it kind of, we were early adopters of, of data streaming platforms like uh, Apache's Kafka project by yeah. Confluent, uh, developed that on LinkedIn. 
Um, and there's a bunch of like data streaming platforms, Spark and, and Apache Storm and, and uh, you know, a bunch of interesting projects that we've kind of experimented with um, trying to figure out how can we do data analytics and data science on streaming data in real time, as well as historical data. Uh, right, and, right. you know, one of the early kind of viable platforms for doing this was uh, Apache Spark. Uh, we started off kind of using Hadoop to do this, but it didn't really work well for streaming analytics. It worked well for batch analysis. Right, right. With these folks. Um, you know, kind of doing it on blocks of data, large chunks. And, uh, you know, that worked really well for historical stuff. And then we just realized that, you know, kind of doing batch hunting like that just didn't really, it wasn't ideal. Uh, we had like detection rules that we wanted to be able to detect in as near real time as possible big thing about riot games is like the culture of at least early on there was that we were kind of uh hands offish it was just you know our goal was not necessarily to to, to prevent it was probably a bad strategy early on uh, but our whole thing was just detect and respond as quickly as possible uh, and so we right. really get as wide uh, uh uh visibility as we possibly could and that just meant like getting as many logs and and you know NetFlow connections and DNS logs and you know everything that we possibly could kind of filtered through uh, a single pipeline or multiple pipelines um, depending on locale. But the idea was, was um, kind of aggregate all of this data in as near real time as possible and then perform streaming analytics and correlations on it. Right. And it started off, you know, where we basically only had the ability to kind of do um, what I like to call atomic alerting, where you're basically alerting on a single event. Mm -hmm. um, it, Really do well with the correlations, I, I, uh, where you're basically alerting on multiple types of events, you know, and kind of doing uh, like a state tracking. Right. At scale, the the resource issues on that kind of get really hard, really fast, especially when you start talking about multiple hosts. Right. Involved. Um, and to this day, like we we basically still kind of have issues with that. Um, a number of advancements have kind of come along, and none of this, you know, is wholly original from our perspective. We just kind of uh, pilfer like some of the best and, and evolving ideas kind of within the infosec community there's a lot of really smart people out there that we'll talk about but um the uh the idea is like some some major innovations that have been happening kind of over the last few years like one of the big mistakes that we made there early on was that we just basically natively ingested the log schemas for dozens of different vendors right we had every different network security platform that you could possibly imagine uh we've tried them all uh right it was very experimental Sometimes we need to have like A-B testing going on where we have like multiple of the same class of product, you know, generating ne network telemetry or log telemetry. Um, you hear that mistake over and over, just like every place you go, talking to SOC teams, just going, ugh, just doesn't work. I mean, one problem is right. that you're basically needing to write, in a lot of cases, log stash transforms, right? Um, to parse like all, first of all can i just complain for a second about how terrible most people's logs are right like there's so much fucked up stuff going on well, there. there's, like, no a lot of... there's no normalization on even the data types right like... no most people still to this day only support syslog which is like a uh, like an unstructured string message right yeah and there's hundreds of them and they're not well documented and and it's just a nightmare other other vendors they're a little bit better they'll do syslog and then inside of syslog they'll have ceph and then in the ceph fields They'll have JSON. And so you're like doing this <laughs> parsing and it's just like trying to do that is a fucking nightmare, especially when you have like, you know, let's just say at the low end, four different vendors to kind of, you know, uh, ingesting logs into like one standard analytics pipeline. Right, right. And right. on an enterprise, you're going to have like, you know, who knows how many vendors are out there and, <laughs> and, and they're, you know, they're half asked written logging if the logging even really is helpful. You know? Right, we see a lot of that where the logs are just, you're going, okay, well, we have the logs. It doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, a lot of people, their first innate approach at solving this problem is just like use Splunk, right? Because Splunk is, you know, I'll yes. be honest, they do have log transformers for almost everything. I mean, they're great in that sense. They've got huge parsers that can, you know. I'm sure, they, they parse in and they make nice reports on the back end that are already ready to go. It's... If, you, yeah. can see, you can see why it wins. The only problem that, like, we looked, we really wanted to use Splunk, but the billing was just the death stroke, right? I mean, yeah, basically, I mean, like, I mean you, you don't even... Even if we only kept security-relevant data, like, the data that we really wanted, like, it was basically the entire IT budget at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have so many clients that that's... 
that's their thing is, well, we don't, we don't have entire log coverage because we just can't afford the, the extra Splunk licenses that it would cost to do that. We'd love to, we just, you know, another, another million dollars in budget, we'd make that happen. I mean, Splunk is a great part of great interface. Like I heard a story from someone recently, they were saying that basically Google uses Splunk, but they're able to get away with the free license. And I guess Splunk hates Google for this because they basically like pre-parsed down and done all their correlations. So Splunk is still the main interface that they use, uh, but all of it's been pre-parsed and analyzed. And so they only are ingesting like super high quality stuff into Splunk and they're able to get away with like less than what is it? 500 megabytes a day or whatever that you can parse. So they're legitimately, um, but they've done so much magic on the front end before it even gets to Splunk that it's, you know, it, it's negligible their data costs. So, I mean, even for some of the other enterprises out there that aren't having cost issues or log standardization issues, what what do you think some of the kind of the philosophical problems that need to be solved that you guys have kind of been trailblazing with some of the new that new solution you have at, at Westward? Um, so, first of all, I mean, the problem with a lot of the security analytics platforms is that they charge, you know, by data volume. Right. Well. And one of the major innovations that's been happening <clears throat> is um, by a guy who's out of Dropbox. I think he just recently left, named Insanity Bit. He wrote an open source system um, that is available. You can go check it out. It's called Grapple, G-R-A-P-L. And one of the major advances that he's kind of been pushing, and I don't, you know, is basically using a graph instead of something like uh, Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch basically takes the approach of like storing the logs in total um, in, a, in, in a, you know, usually daily index. Uh, and so you have tons of redundant data. Like I might have a string that, that exists in index from today and tomorrow. And there, maybe there's like a standard Windows log message, basic example, right? Like, uh, you know, blah, 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 logged in, right? And you're going to have like a billion copies of the same message. There's not a lot of uh, normalization kind of going on there underneath right, the hood. Right. Uh, and especially across the <clears throat> indexes, and the data volumes just get really, really big. Uh, Insanity Bay uh, kind of really pushed the advent of graph databases. And we were exploring this too before I'd even heard of them. But this kid is awesome. Um, and he basically is able to save a lot of space by storing things in a graph. So like everything that's unique will have its own graph kind of node entry. Mm -hmm. uh, you pay a little bit of the cost of like, how do you do those joins <laughs> kind of up front? Um, but it's, it pays off in, in spades later because you know so many of the, the SIEM systems, the security information event management or whatever you want to call it, the monitoring, um, systems, you know, they, they're really not good. Splunk's terrible at joining data. Like if you ask really complex questions of the data, um, sometimes those queries can take, you know, minutes or hours. Whereas if you're kind of like using a graph database to store, uh, some of this data, then it becomes just a matter of being like, yo, what are the connected edges? We've already done the joins up front right. as the right. data into the storage repository. Um, which, you know, that's kind of a desirable characteristic when it comes to a system that's designed for incident response. Right. Because, I mean, from my perspective, a lot of a lot of the incident response stuff and even on the other things that we work on, like a lot of it ends up being very target centric. And so edges and nodes and and interconnectivity end up being the thing that we're looking for. Like, what's the biggest blip on the radar? Like. Even, you know, I just want to ask simple questions. Show me that, you know, like Brian, you've got some good, you know, methods in your, your toolkit that we were yeah. talking about last week. So I mean, we're, we're just looking at volumes and things like that and going, you know, I don't, I don't even care what it says. Just, just show me unusual volumes and the, you know, changes on file systems and stuff like this, um, you know, over, over time, you know, cause systems are really, honestly, once they run for a while, really kind of static, right? You generate the same amount of data, you know, same file system changes, things like that. So yeah, anytime you can start looking at just those those changes without having to get into actual content review is, is a huge bonus. I was reading something the other day, they were like, I mean, this is kind of going along with lines of what you're saying, Brian, like the number one detection for detecting compromise in the cloud is just looking at huge increases in your cloud bills, <laughs> right? Like right. basic, what do you call it? Stochastic? Yeah. St stochastic analysis. Yeah. It's anything that you can measure over time. 
<laughs> but like simple things like just looking at your cloud build doubled in size like oh shit we're compromised like this that's the number one detection for detecting compromise in the cloud and and you hear those stories over and over again from from azure and aws shops that you know like it, it, because oftentimes what happens is you know the intruder does to to run whatever they're going to do and it's always because somebody AWS keys yeah. to a public GitHub, yeah. right? There's like scan, like scanner constantly looking for. It. I remember one time we got really lucky. We were at Riot, and I guess a developer leaked their key, and within 20 minutes or something like that, like it spun up all the maximum size GPU instances, yep. and yep. our bill was like 10 million dollars <laughs> or something. I just people got 14 million dollar you know, AWS bills, because it turns out there's a hundred max GPU instances running like full out. Um, <laughs> you know, you'll put a business out really quick, unless Amazon's, you know, forgiving. And in some cases they're not, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're not running truffle hog on your, on your uh, GitHub repositories and, and making sure you don't have creds in there, you're, you're, you're just missing the boat because it's, it's just a human developer sort of thing, right? You're you're rushing to get that code done. You're like, oh, I'll just drop that key in here just just to test. And yeah, Dude, next I, thing you I, know, yeah, I I saw somebody somebody called me like two years ago, and now they're like the super popular company. Uh, they called me and they're like, yeah, one of our developers pushed some of our keys up into you know this repo, and our entire infrastructure is gone. <laughs> like, yeah, competitors saw it and just deleted RM to their whole infrastructure. So they were down for like a few days, and you know, luckily they had backups. But like, man, it was like the bane of their existence for a few days. And I was just like, man, maybe you should have some monitoring on that. You know, like, yeah, and and there's there's commercial tools for doing that stuff. Uh, there's freeware tools. Like I said, the Truffle Hog tool for doing that will just just run through your GitHub repo and and. Uh, and identify all that for you and you know even in the best run dev shops and stuff it happens it just it just happens yeah it does it does you know um so you know take a little bit of precaution also wanted to mention uh just since you you said it there zach um the uh you, you can find insanity bit stuff on github at just you know github uh, slash insanity bit all one word in this graphic <clears throat> it's all there stuff like that super cool that's a super cool project. It brings yeah. up like all these really interesting possibilities that weren't possible before. Like for example, the whole lensing technique that he's kind of got going on is this whole idea of like using, uh, like there's a lot of times analysts will, this is something my partner Carl and I talk about a lot. It's like the detection rule, like just detecting who am I, right? It's something that like, eh, or did every time somebody on your enterprise types who am I, I mean, that's a, that depends, right? It's useful to record, but do you really want to start an investigation there? It depends. Right? Well, I mean, it just, is. I mean, knowing about I believe shells. The, yes, Carl and I are both big fans of this. We should have like, say again. I was saying, I mean, I, I would, I would start pivoting on that pretty quickly. Just, you know, like how many times yeah. do people do who am I like when they're not hackers, right? Like, Right. Normal how many people times don't have, do that. Yeah. How many times have you popped a box and you're like, who am I? <laughs> or just ID, boom, you know? Exactly. Right. Um, well, I, I think that's in conjunction with, you know, if that's quickly followed by PWD or a few of these other things, you know, like, okay, now now I'm seriously interested in that. Absolutely. Yeah. So the whole notion of lensing is because you're looking things on a on a graph database, you can start to use like shortest path first and like routing algorithms to like map or you know similar things to just be like, what let's look at all the things. So lensing, we can write alerts there. Maybe we don't want to show an analyst, but they're still interesting, right? Like you might have file, you know, browser downloaded file is is the documented example that he has kind of in the graph documentation. There's like all kinds of like less interesting things that maybe you don't want to necessarily generate an alert, but you still want to record as interesting. Right, um, right. Carl and I, my partner and I talk about them being like observables, but not alertables, right? Yeah, yeah. You want to observe them and record them, but you don't necessarily want to show an analyst that. But until later, until something maybe then a human really does want to take a look at, and then they're like, oh, here's this other interesting stuff that happened right alongside of it. Um, then, you know, and, and that's the whole notion of lensing is being able to kind of zoom in and look 
at things around it that were maybe less interesting, but now within the context of like a higher fidelity alert now become right, extremely. Right. You get some uh, of that, you know, some of that context and helps speed up the process. You know? That's something that is almost impossible to do using traditional <laughs> SIMP, right? Like, but when, as soon as you start thinking about things from a graph database perspective, it opens up a lot of really interesting things. Another thing that we're kind of looking at is like, all right, let's say you have an alert on one host that's high fidelity. And then you're able to kind of track up the process and inheritance tree, and then maybe across the network connection to another host that you're getting telemetry from. Right. That maybe also has a lower fidelity alert. But like the idea of being able to really quickly kind of tell this complex story across multiple hosts, even, uh, is super appealing. And traditional detection techniques can't do that very well. Right. Um, and 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 I mean that's a lot of what you guys are bringing with Westward is let's turn this into a story. Yeah, you so know, a big thing I that mean, we're kind of working on, and we, we're, you know, we're not the first people to talk about this, but storytelling itself. I mean, when you talk about incident response, it's a timeline. Yeah. Right. You have a bunch of disparate events that are at, at least at first <laughs> disparate, and you go through and you're annotating and marking them up, just like you would like in IDA Pro, where you're like mm -hmm. annotating uh, an RE, you know, a, a, a PE file, sorry, that, uh, you know, you, and you might want to share those notes with somebody else. And so, like, the whole notion of a story is you have multiple analysts that are kind of adding events to a timeline uh, to tell like an overarching coherent storyline of this is the first point of compromise, this is the lateral movement, this is the data exfiltration, or more ideally, this is the data, you know, the, the compromise prevention. <laughs> um, but that whole notion is something, you know, people talk about, it's the same thing as case management, but when you kind of just flip it just a little bit, it opens up this whole new kind of uh, way of looking at things. And I right. think that there's a that web, you know, modern web technology can bring to kind of the table there where you can do things where, you know, we're using things like GitHub, GitHub Markdown and we want to start using things like Twitter style hashes yeah, where yeah, you, yeah. Like we can share this timeline maybe with, uh, you know, multiple classes of, of, of users of our system, right? Like you might, you might have the timeline want to be available to all the other analysts so they get all the technical levels of information, but you might want to hashtag a synthetic event added to a timeline and say this, you know, this is hashtag for the CSO's eyes, right? Hashtag CSO. Right. right. Well, and I think you yeah, and I exactly. just just met with a company and talked about that, where they they tell the time they they tell the story one way for the analyst, right, from initial detection to conclusion, but for management, mm -hmm. you start at the conclusion and tell the story backwards as to how we detected it. Yeah, and a big problem also, like during the like, think about any. I, you guys are both like excellent incident responders. I'm sure you guys actually I've been in the trenches with you guys when we've experienced this, where it's like, all right, you're doing the investigation, new information is coming in by the minute as you're kind of going through and doing your analysis, but you have to stop and then share that with your manager who then has to stop and share that with their manager and right, maybe right. board of directors. That whole workflow is something that I think is, it's ripe for innovation right there. And so kind of using. Yeah, that's, like, yeah, that's, that's a good reminder. I might, I, I made a whole graph of that workflow that, that we did with, this super long investigation, I guess a few years ago now, um, Brian, it was, it was the investigation where we basically segmented up everybody into their own role. We have the acquirers, you know, the guys who are getting yep. the new data. And then we have the indexers guys indexing, you know, email or, you know, disks or network traffic. And then the, you know, the data exploitation phase, which was, okay, we need to start going through for context on this. And then the next phase was what, what I called the gold digger phase. You know, that, that was basically Brian and I at the very top end looking at like the things that we had the most context on that then could push requirements back down and then push requirements back up where, you know, it was just a daily report at the end where we would put five or six bullet points in for the, for the client at the end of the day and just shove it out and um we even we even wrote like our first report generator tool just around that you know just yeah. so we could just highlight put a few findings in a small executive overview one page ship it up and if they had any questions they'll they'll ask but otherwise we're just going to keep going about everything that we're orchestrating right now and and that workflow worked really well when we worked worked with all the right tools and the right people so like egos would get in the way we'd just fire them you know or you know 
bad people in the group, just, you know, get rid of them and bad tools, get rid of the bad tools. And, and by the end of about a year and a half, man, we, I think we had over like 90 tags of evidence in that case or something. Oh yeah. There was like, an extreme amount of data there. And I don't even know how many terabytes of data, you know, that, um, ridiculous ridiculous amounts I'll, I, I, I try and block it out but I just remember there was just rolling sets of encryption <laughs> right right yeah never stop we'd we'd get through one set and we'd be like woo we're into the oh no more encryption no. just more but, encryption <laughs> yeah. but yeah what you're saying is absolutely right and I find myself doing this all the time as, a, as an incident manager for you know, for our clients is you know I'm I'm essentially managing that timeline story right i'm right like you like you said i'm just taking in data and passing out new tasks going okay you got that how do you you know where do you think that's going next yep that sounds good go ahead and then i'm logging a little bit of that on you know this is what we know right now and, and, and making sure that you know everybody stays aware of of the big picture um but you, yeah you have to do that over a time it, it's silly but like <laughs> the most useful tool in an incident is stupid timeline graph i mean i know man you know. i just bust out the excel spreadsheet every it's... time <laughs> we're big fans of the excel spreadsheet um <laughs> i mean it's great right uh i and I, I think that one of the things that kind of we designed at westward was making us like a spreadsheet based app that we want for us right and so a lot of like what westward is is built for analysts by analysts i think that's yeah kind of... yeah that's right I, I think it's your tag yeah but uh, the, the whole idea is like we really wanted to focus on like little gains, you know, that will have a net win for analysts. And so we've really kind of tried to focus on all kinds of things. Kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, like one of the big things that we think is a big win is, you know, when we were talking about the problem of having, you know, dozens of different vendor schemas kind of being ingested into a pipeline, that becomes a big problem for analysts. They need to memorize the Microsoft schema and the Apple OS X schema and the, you know, you know all these different vendors you might have FireEye and blah yada 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 and so one of the coolest projects i think that's come out in the last couple of years is by a cat named cyber war dog on twitter uh and he released something called ossem or the open source security <coughs> event model i think is what it is i might, I might be wrong um <coughs> pardon me and uh basically what he's aiming to do is kind of create uh, a data model that he uses in his health project, the the Hunter's Elastic Search, you know, log slash and, and whatever. Uh, but the idea is like he creates a normalized data model where, regardless of your downstream kind of EDR solution, um, you know, they want to they want to try to map it onto a standard data model. And, and the net win for the analyst there is that they only have to memorize one data model instead of forty different vendors. And the quality of life just improves dramatically when you're like, oh yeah, writing a rule, I don't have to go, and, and especially trying to join across, maybe you're doing correlations from like a network telemetry platform and a host EDR, uh, and, and you've got to go and do the joins across the schema from one vendor to the next, and it just becomes super problematic. You're like constantly looking at documentation uh, to like look up and see like what are the, the fields called? And you know, something like OSCM kind of sol like works to try to solve that problem. and. So Westwood, we've also heavily invested in trying to normalize all the kind of EDR and network telemetry platforms that we integrate with onto OSSEM. Right, right. Uh, and kind of up front. And we've basically taken a hard stand and said, yo, we're not going to ingest data that we can't normalize. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that, that can be problematic uh, for some customers who want to move faster. But we really kind of have tried to really focus on just improving the overall quality of life for analysis. And what that means in actuality is you know, reducing the amount of steps and calculations that they need to take when they're under the gun and, you know, your, your organization is possibly compromised and, and a dumpster fire, right? Like every second counts. And so streamlining the way that they can do the detection, the way that they can do the analysis, uh, streamlining even the way that they can update management and that management can update their management, you know, trying to create uh, things that will give you back minutes and seconds and even hours, um, and that goes back to like looking at how we do data joins too. Like up front. Yeah. all of that stuff is going to, you know, when you need to ask a really hard question and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, of your data sets uh, and being able to get that question answered really quickly, you know, all that stuff really matters when there's user data walking out the front door as we speak. And you're right, trying to tell right. people, get to the point where you can kind of, you know, in the face of the OODA loop, you know, make a, an action, right? 
I agree. Uh, I mean, one. I mean, just kind of putting different words to the same thing you're saying. I mean, you guys are reducing steps, saving time. You're, you're, you know, saving time on data normalization, saving time on detection, saving time on, you know, reporting and enabling focus from, exactly. you know, 15 years of doing it and one of the largest enterprises. I mean, um, I know I've had the privilege of working with a lot of different teams over the years, and I would say Riot and probably two or three other companies are up there on the top end of, you know, let's say tier one cyber operator type stuff. You know, like you guys had so many different problem sets at such a large scale, you know, condensing that down into Westward is pretty awesome. For what you guys are struggling yeah, right now, I, I you know, really lucky to have been involved with Riot when it grew from you know 200 employees all the way up to you know thousands, and you know watching it grow and being involved in that was extremely fortunate. Just because we got to deal with so many interesting problems, and Riot was a shop where, um, you know, we were able to kind of tackle these things in innovative ways. A lot of the industry standard solutions kind of just break down when you're dealing with those volumes of data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so we kind of got to roll our own in a lot of cases. And, you know, that could be problematic, but it was also really interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you guys I, had some of the, you know, I'll brag on you guys. You guys had some really cool incidents uh, that you had to handle, you know, from external and insider and, you know, crossing all these geographical boundaries and, you know, calling people's moms, telling them to stop. And hey, that's, I still <laughs> swear by that technique. If the kid is like, you know, just calling his mom is like the number one prevention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go have a beer with the guy, get your attribution <laughs> on and call his mom, you know? Yeah. We've, we've totally done that one before too, with some of the guys stealing keys and stuff like that. You just go and catch up with them in their dorm room and go like, look, we're going to call your dad and we're going to let him know. And, and you're going to get kicked out of school. And they're just like, please, no, not my dad. Don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they and they give up everybody on the team. You know, they everything you want to know. Here's all the. Here's everything we've been doing. You yeah. Know, or send the out. dossier. Send the dossier to all their family members, and then they're just in the shame pool for like at least two years. You know. We recently did that on a uh, on an insider case. Uh, they were committing a bunch of contract fraud and things like this. Cost the company about three million dollars, and uh, the guys. The, the insider one of the insiders kind of the ringleader of the team his father was um a, a luminary in that that field and uh, we literally just brought him in the conference room and sweated him and like you know look you're gonna get fired and we're gonna you know we're gonna sue you we're gonna you know we're gonna like this is gonna be out he's like you can't let my dad find out about this this, this guy's 40 years old <laughs> you know but that that technique still works like just you know it's it's silly but it, it works well it, it's just shifting the goals you know everybody wants the the fbi and and department of justice or somebody to come swooping in and and doing some arrests and it's like how can we just neutralize this that's that's my my goal it's like let's just neutralize it you know yeah i mean this guy would give up anything well he did he gave up everybody else involved in the, <laughs> in the conspiracy there rather than like you know tarnish the family name in the industry yeah that's pretty awesome. And Zach calls their mom. <laughs> we did have a lot of really interesting kids. It was cool working there because, I mean, you're you're dealing with a huge player base, like tens of millions of players. Uh, and you've got meat space kind of blending over into cyberspace. Yeah. We've got festival events and esports stuff going on that was really interesting. Well, I think that's what makes some of it get overlooked is, is all the back-end work that you guys did kind of gets overshadowed by just how big League was and, you know, basically – creating that whole you know uh e-gaming environment and stuff like that that you know well, it is, it just created people tend to like not think about all the, all the computers and all the benefits and all the security behind that man yeah there was a really interesting documentary that was just released on that company that's really interesting and it, it talks about some of the problems that uh you know that, that we highly recommend it watched it well, so Zach, when when people want to come, you know, engage with Westward, what what are some of the kind of those direct calls to action? How can they become a customer, or how can they engage with you guys? Um, what are some of the things you guys are looking for for some of those clients 
um, as you guys move forward. So just reach out to me. We're, we're basically looking for anyone that kind of is just interested in, you know, um, analyzing their telemetry. We really kind of are a log, uh, telemetry shop. We don't do like general system logging. We're not a log, log uh, you know, investigators or a SOC team, right? Um, and if they don't, I mean, we're slowly realizing that we may need to pivot. A lot of companies want to take advantage of the capabilities that Westward offers, but don't necessarily have a dedicated security and instrument response. Um, so we're kind of slowly figuring out that we may need to pivot our business model a little bit. Thanks, Dextra. Uh, you know, to doing um, managed security monitoring as well. Um, yeah. So we're not just building the platform, but we'll also manage for them and kind of do the monitoring there. Uh, so it's both. So basically anybody that kind of has like a large fleet of computers um, and they have some kind of either EDR or telemetry generating system like Sysmon um, on, on, on the platform and, and it, you know, wants to send us their logs and, and is comfortable kind of sending that stuff into the cloud. I mean, we're a cloud kind of SIM, if you will. Um, and really, I don't like to use the word SIM because, the you know, things like Splunk are so much more fully featured where we can't really compete with that, but uh, at least not right now. And the idea is like, we want to be a storytelling platform. So anybody who wants to tell stories with their digital data in, in terms of security analytics, like come talk to me um, or my partner, Carl, reach out to us via email. The website is westward.ai um, and you can engage with us there or on Twitter. You know, that's kind of our main medium and platform that we like to keep in touch with a lot of the community. So we are really looking right now um, for partners that want to test the platform kind of at scale. We're doing integrations with you know a bunch of different EDR vendors at this time, so we're, we're working on Sentinel One integrations, and we're working on you know um, endgame integrations, that kind of thing. So anybody who's got uh, a security you know EDR solution or whatever, and, and wants to be able to maybe if they have multiple EDR solutions, like being able to write rules mm -hmm. uh, on across multiple EDRs is is kind of nice. A lot of those things are typically proprietary. One of the cool things that we like to joke about is like even with like if you have telemetry, like Carbon Black is a good example, like that. They, they generate a lot of cool telemetry, but the rule language itself is not expressive enough to do really cool or complex things. I like believe, believe the word is painful, just just utterly painful. I'm not going to yeah. Josh. Hashtag <laughs> pain. <laughs> what it is. Not, not a competitor, just a guy on the downside going, no oh my God. <laughs> you know, pull punches, but we're also here not here to talk shit. The point yeah. is, is, like the rule language itself is really kind of know I am. atomic alerting and not composite alerting. So one of the other cool innovations I want to talk about is Endgame Systems, now part of Elastic. Um, there was a guy out of there named Ross Wolf who developed uh, the event query language, which mm -hmm. is super interesting um, in terms of it's basically, you know, designed for doing really complex kind of correlations. Um, and it's designed to be easy on the eyes. You know, I, I know you've all looked at kind of different detection languages. I'm thinking, looking at you, Splunk, and, and mm -hmm. you know, even some of the, the Sigma stuff sometimes can be kind of painful to read. Um, whereas EQL is, is really designed to just read like a SQL query language. Uh, and yeah. blew me away the first time I saw it. Like you, you had like this super complex query up. It was like, wait, that totally makes sense. It's, right. it's it utterly was, readable. Correlation across multiple different things happening on, you know. Different yeah, languages. over time. I mean, it was like, but that I can just go this thing when that happens, if this and that happens too. I'm like, wow. And I, you know, in a lot of other tools, I don't even know how the hell I'd write that. Right. Exactly. You, I mean, you know, I'd have to write three or four sets of rules and somehow try and link them together. I'll, you know, in order to do that, a lot of people will break out into things like Python and Jupyter right. notebooks and, and do it in, in, you know, in slow time. Uh, whereas, you know, things like EQL will allow you to do that on stream data sets in real time, yeah. which is super freaking cool. Um, we recently ran into, I guess, there that we ran into a licensing issue where uh, they had released it as AGPL3. And so I, I was like trying to, re I reached out to Ross because we were like looking to add support for uh, database engine, like our database stuff to, um, so that we could do historical search using EQL as well as like stream analysis stuff. And he was like, so how are you guys licensing this? Cause it is AGPL3. And I was just like, oh crap. Like we're this far down the startup mo mode. And like, we're just now like, and we didn't want to step on anybody's toes. We want to give back to the community. We're contributing code back everywhere that we possibly can. Uh, but one of the things, yeah, we had like an oh shit moment where it was just like, oh man, do we need to shut up the business? Because like our whole thing is so dependent upon EQL. 
And then we started looking at Microsoft's Custo, which is similar to EQL, but it's designed only for Azure data. Uh, and to my knowledge, doesn't do streaming, but it's really good for hunting. Um, but it's also a similar kind of style of language that just has really cool features in it, K-U-S-T-O. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I, I, I was talking to Ross and I was just like, oh man, what can we do? And he was like, dude, like, as far as I understand it, like any code that interfaces with this, like needs to be open sourced itself. I mean, the, the license itself is literally described as a virus that replicates, right? Because like everything that it touches, even if you have other web services and things like this that like interface with it, uh, you know, and so we basically were at a point where like, do we need to open source our entire platform? Because it all interfaces with EQL. And then it crossed my mind. I was like, wait a minute, Endgame's agent itself uses EQL, right? Like, do they need to open source their, their EDR solution? Like all of this stuff, like it, it's just problematic. So I think... <laughs> <laughs> so they it changed the license, didn't they? Yeah, well, they're working on it. So last I talked to him <laughs> uh, on Twitter, he was basically saying, hey, dude, internal conversations are progressing well on changing the license. There's no other software that's under the Elastic Company umbrella that I believe is AGPL3. It's all just endgame stuff. But now that it's kind of owned by uh, by Elastic, I think they're probably going to change that license. But it's it's still something that I think about. Like, what if they decide not to? Like. That impacts our entire business model. But well, think, and Elastic's in the business of, of helping you incorporate their solutions into your solutions, right? Th that's their whole model, right? Yeah. yeah. Use our stuff, incorporate our stuff, you know, build build new and cool solutions yeah. with our stuff. So now, yeah, and, and I've got to, like, throw this out there, too. Like, how many folks have come up and tried to just buy, buy y'all's technology just right up right right away you know one offer to buy already we didn't actually talk any numbers because my partner and i weren't interested i mean this is something i personally this is something that i want to do for a long time i think that the same technologies that we're developing here are useful in stuff that dan i've worked with you in the past on like counter human trafficking and dykstra mm -hmm. too uh, and i think that like some of the like there's little i mean there's a big difference but i think that a lot of the tech is still useful for doing workflow for investigation yeah. around pattern human trafficking. That was one of the most interesting things was working closely with you guys. Uh, you know, that was several years ago now. And I'm not gonna yeah. go into details on that, but uh, you know, being involved in, in some of those kind of investigations was eye-opening and inspiring. And that's something that I think that a technological system like Westward could be kind of adapted for in the future. So that's kind of like right. MVP 2.0. Like in a couple of years, I'd like to start, once we get solid market for doing security analytics for cybersecurity, uh, one of the things that I'd like to kind of expand our, our offerings for is, and, and, you know, obviously work a lot with the nonprofit community and, and do it almost for free. It's, that's just a place that I would like to play. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there, but I, I think that being in the kind of agnostic place that you guys are at with, it doesn't matter what kind of data it is we're, we're, you're going to normalize it and then start pull, pulling a story around that timeline that's what I mean. That's target centric analysis in the end that enables other decisions that can be acted upon in a way that tells a story. It it pushes things up to law enforcement or whomever that they can reduplicate themselves. And hey, now there's there's a real case there, um, and and other analytical microservices can do whatever they need to do outside of that space. But you know, just condensing that story correlating things normalizing things it's awesome you know and it's a hard problem it is a hard problem and that's kind of why we do it like i just spent some time basically trying to write a transpiler that takes an eql query and converts it to elastic search syntax <laughs> and that's a really freaking hard problem to do especially when you start getting about like really complex series of like nested and or you know and or statements and 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 that's a lot of fun for me is like looking at things like grammars and compiler tech and transpiler tech and, and how do you translate one query language to another. One of the things I recently did, I, I still need to open source this, but I wrote an, uh, a Sigma C. Uh, are you guys familiar with the Sigma C project? It's basically uh, something that I believe was written by Thomas Patsky and, and Florian Roth, but the idea is like they, this is really an interesting concept. So you, everyone's familiar with Sigma, I hope. It's basically right. like open source standard for kind of doing rule like the sim rules it's really kind of more again like atomic centric it's on individual kind of log entries that it's a lot of the rules are it doesn't have kind of composite alerting although i believe florian and, and thomas are kind of pushing to go that direction um, but one of the cool projects behind it uh, i believe written by thomas paskey 
uh, is the Sigma C where they basically can like transpile rules written in Sigma to like various backends. So like you could have a Sigma rule, you can import it into uh, Splunk or, you know, you know, you know the, a dozen different other kind of uh, ER and SIM solutions. And so it's a really cool technology. And so we were looking, that's, and there's a huge data set too that Florian pushes that, that's open source. And so we were looking at like, how can we import some of these rules without having to hand write them uh, and so I, I spent some time basically writing a backend for 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 Sigma C to like be able to convert Sigma rules into EQL, and that's you know really interesting problems, hard hard stuff, and it's really kind of stuff that's super interesting to me. Um, on the on the other end of that, I think I like one of the things I liked about the product is we could just push Sysmon out onto the network, you know, no no, no specific real real buy-in to get this started up from mm -hmm. that standpoint. I, I can push out a you know, a ready to go Windows tool, pre configure it however I like, and then you can just ingest that data and we, boom, we're up and running, you know, and that's great. you know, without kind of weird endpoint, you know, tie-ins and stuff like that. So if I got a log source over there, great. If I just have a bunch of individual systems, fantastic. Here's a, here's a ready to go way to, to make that logging happen. Yeah. I mean, we started with this one, right? Like that was the first kind of, yeah. Together. System that we're just like, yo, this is kind of a, a, a gold standard. Um, I think Rosanovich has a, some room for improvement, but it's it's really really good. Yeah, um, and and it's free, so like you could push it out, and you can use. The, what was that system that you were telling me that you love to use to do like tactical deployment of? Oh, uh, PDQ, uh, PDQ. P PDQ deploy. Yeah, we we actually just use that to push uh, to push Sysmon out over a, a hospital network. Uh, we had a, a selection of systems we wanted to to uh, push it to, so we made a little list of like here's here's the IPs. Roop, you know, yes. I mean, five you minutes later, it's it's on all those systems. Exactly, and you can compare it. You can uh, like add something like WinLog beats or NXLog, yep. Logly, you know, and then you can remotely forward that telemetry to anywhere that you want really really quickly. I mean, on the systems to get super low cost. I mean, how much did you say it was? PDQ was like sixty bucks or something. Oh yeah, the the deploy module was was nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> way better than some clunky batch script that kind of works via PSXEC or whatever way you want to do it. Right? Oh, no. How many times did you do that? Right, like, all right, let's just deploy this. How are we going to deploy this? Let's just use uh, PSXEC. Yeah, I wrote right. this PowerShell yeah. script. It's it's mostly works. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've it kind of works of most of the I've time. I've done a lot of automation around PowerShell. I've done automation around. Uh, PS exec. And then the other thing that we've done a lot of like really clunky automation is using Carbon Black's live response. Like, you know how a lot of PR solutions have the ability to like log in and get shells? Oh my God. <laughs> Any one of those approaches is terrible. Use something like PDQ or a jam for, a, you know, yeah. if you can. But so, I mean, yeah. like when you're in a bind, you're just kind of like, dude, we've got an enterprise that's owned. Like, we've got time ticking right now. Well, and that's what I, th I think makes that great is I could just take something like, you know, uh, you know, Sysmon, which is Microsoft product. I'm not worried about it hurting anything and whoop, rapid deploy that. And we're getting data off of all those machines right now. Mm -hmm. Rules are being applied. We're starting to see, you know, real time stuff. Tactical IR, it's great. It's yeah. So. And you firing up a Splunk, you know, I mean, you're going to get, you know, Splunk's great for that kind of tactical IR stuff. We're really looking in the future. We haven't done this yet, but with Westward, we want to kind of get on a play payment platform where it's like you, I ultimately would like you to be able to spin up your own kind of elastic, I'm sorry, uh, your own Westward kind of collection agent and anal analysis front end without us needing to be involved. We're not there yet. We're still kind of building it out, but we'd ultimately like to get to the point where you could use it for tactical IR if you needed to be low cost. Well, and I think there's a lot of clients that, you know, they they aren't necessarily looking for that, right? They don't they don't have the people for that. <laughs> you know, there's just some percentage of the, of the population out there that has that, but other places they're you know they're, they're going to be looking for for your organization to be like, where's the easy button that I push to do this? Sorry guys, we didn't have an easy button yet. Yeah, you need oh. the easy button. You need the easy button. Um, I've actually been looking at like what are the stats of having a buy now button on your website. Well, we do want an easy button for deploying it, but we don't yeah. have a button for solve my problem. I was recently in a call with somebody in the military and they were like, 
you should make this more like kellybluebook.com. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? This is an yeah, analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need, yeah. <laughs> questions. And I love that call. I came up with, like, the insight that I took away from that was like, okay, he wants a query builder, right? I mean, basically, you want, like, a 90s minivan with AC and uh, a compact disc. You know, yeah, like yeah. Well, I mean, that's how you oh, need. Oh, got one of those. It's in, you know, Minnesota or something, you know? Right, right. <laughs> I'm down for you. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, and I me, had a hard yeah. time understanding how we make it. We're just like holding their hand. Like there's an easy button where it's just like, let's just walk them through this menu-driven system to get to the point where they're no longer hackable. I just don't. Right, yeah. I, I Buttonology have... versus methodology. But I mean, I'm, I'm just talking about like buttonology, like put a button on your website, like buy now, right? Like. Well, yeah, that 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 we do want to do. I, I want it to be like Amazon, where you can basically deploy, you know, the whole collection and analysis engine without needing to get somebody from Westward on the phone or on email. I'll, I'll actually throw some interesting stats out here. Within eighteen months, if you have a buy now button, your revenue doubles. Oh, we're a data source. So it's this, the data source was from this company called uh, StoryBrand, but they, they've helped, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of companies with, you know, like clarifying their message and all that kind of stuff. And, and so um, it's, it's pretty interesting, like the, the insights that they have and then the actual like second side of that story of revenue generation. So they were talking to me about that and, I was like, man, that's kind of cool. Like the, the psychology behind that, 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 you know, I'll just click this button and I'll get whatever I needed. Right. Like, yeah. so it's just kind of interesting. Cause it's like you, you cut out the sales process, you cut out talking, you cut out, like, let's say it's, let's say they, that they're correct only for 15% revenue increase. Right. Like, boom. Like, I, I think that's, that's what Amazon has taught us to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Like I go there, I search for what I want and I go, yep, this is the one click here. It'll be at my house, you know, later today or tomorrow. Yeah. Amex you know, black that I'm for me. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, so I think there's a, you know, there's definitely some relevance behind, you know, the services that, that we do and sell, you know, that, uh, you know, click here for IR support. Okay. <laughs> you know? uh, it seems crazy that anybody would buy like that, but I think, we've been trained into that method yeah it'll be interesting we're gonna figure that out because i mean sims are typically like a bigger purchase price like people yeah. don't just go shopping on a weekend for a sim right? it's almost like a religious choice like but on the other hand they do right D download your splunk now it could be oh, up wow. and running in five minutes you know and you're like well that sounds good to me burp exactly <laughs> I'll let you know in a couple of months when we work that out, Brian if, or Dan, if, if this, if that's true. Yeah. I'll let you know too, because I'm going to do it on all of our companies. I, I'm totally doing it. I'm just going to see a... like, what do I have to lose? Right. Like, yep. It's at that point. That, right. But... That was my thought. You, you will soon be able to buy computer forensic services and IR services from ADF, which is push the button. Need it now. That's awesome. Yeah. Add to cart. I, yeah. I want to do my cart, baby. <laughs> and then, and then you like Brian. You need to have some special, like, special thing. Like, if it's like a day before holiday or on a holiday, like it auto just injects another line item. Like, it, it auto just doubles the price. Yeah, uh, <laughs> holiday torture price. Because yeah. I know you just got ransomware on Christmas. One right. thing I have to say about doing IR work, and I respect the hell out of you guys. I did it for years, and I just spent way too much time away from my family. And I've got a little mm. one. There's just so much about IR that I just I love, but I also simultaneously there's so many things that I hate, like being in the trenches with you guys and having all these awesome war stories and and counter hacking hackers in a lot yeah. of cases and doing interesting stuff. Like that stuff is awesome. I just don't want to miss the good years anymore, you know? So I've kind of changed my lifestyle and it's one of the motivation, one of the motivations for starting a product company was wanting to travel less. And, and I'm, I'm in the same boat with you on that too. Like I remember probably, it was a few years ago, probably four, maybe four or five years ago. Um, and Dykstra, you had, I had pulled you in on this incident and um, I remember like the CISO ended up saying something along the lines of like, well, the attacker's only a script kitty. I don't think that the impact's going to be that bad. It's no big deal. And I was like, but you guys don't have two-factor authentication. So, like, 
pretty much your own, right? Like, we just don't know how bad yet. And I remember he had this smirk look on his face, and, and I remember, like, the guy didn't really believe what I was talking about. And I was just like, I just don't care anymore. Like, dude, I don't care, right? <laughs> like, and I, and, and, you know, we went through all the motions after that, and, and I was just like, when, when I stop caring, unless it's something like that, like, there has to be a relationship there for the incident response for me now. And I just haven't done it yet again. I mean, I've done a few investigations, obviously, um, with the stuff I'm working on, but it's not like, I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to, I don't have to go do crazy incident response stuff when people are just, you know, their world is melting and China just stole all their stuff and, you know, Russia just ran somewhere at everything and, you know, everyone's freaking out. And, and then they're really wondering, like, does this kind of hacker looking dude really have what it takes? And it's like, dude, your enterprise sucks. And I'm going to tell you how to fix it, but don't, don't try to like have some doubt within the first 36 hours. Cause your, your guys suck so bad, you know? And I don't want to so, travel, right? Like so, I'm the same so, way. So, so bringing in the topical weekly stuff, ZDNet three hours ago just reported that under half of all organizations are prepared for cyber attacks, which follows up on a nice article that CNBC ran this weekend uh, that said there's a four million person deficit in the uh, area of cybersecurity and that 65 percent of companies report that they have a shortage of, of people in that space. I, I don't know how you overcome that, but but. It goes back and results well, in, in that thing where we're at, which is, you know, people just aren't, you know, you have a lot of people out there not really taking their cybersecurity seriously. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, you keep seeing that over and over, like, but you do see some people that are taking it seriously. Like, let's, sure. let's do some props out to Joey Johnson. I was just going to say that. You know, like <laughs> Joey Joey has been one of the most progressive CISOs for a long time. Sure. He takes he take he looks at the problems from an external perspective. He looks at the internal analysis problems like for the analyst. And then he takes a philosophical approach to the problem where like I mean, what was it? You know, 8 or 9 years ago we we threw him that the philosophical problem of like we need assurance like you should just pay us to reverse engineer this for six or seven months and he went for it right like and and we found all these vulnerabilities and it was great um but like joey's like the success that kind of just always follows him in his wake is awesome because he doesn't come come to the table with this like i'm the super awesome CISO. You know, like, or, or, you know, like, he just, like, he knows what he, what he's good at, and he knows how to run a team, and he, and he understands the, the analyst, and I love it, man. Like, that guy, he should get the, 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 the CISO of, of the year award from, like, some prominent place that I've, you know, maybe RSA yeah. or something, right? No, 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 there was a, he won best CISO for the America Southeast, I think. Maybe it was even two years running. I'm not sure. Right. Oh, I saw it two years ago. I don't know if it was two years running. That was but... that was like CSO Magazine or something like that, oh. right? Nice. I think Joe. So Joey's awesome because he brings street level knowledge into the boardroom. Right. I think a lot of CISOs, uh, th they maybe know how to speak the business language, but they don't understand the. I mean, Joey came from a technical background, right, up into management, and that's. I'm not gonna say uncommon because I don't really have any knowledge or stats on that, but. You know, the thing that he does really, really, really well is he can take a he trusts his technical people, right? And, right, and he he will f go to bat for them in a boardroom, and then see like the boardroom folks, like he's really able to kind of eloquently explain risk and make trade offs. Um, and so his his compatriots or peers, like in, in, in the C suite, I think just have an immense level of respect for him, he's able to execute really well. Um, and yeah. you know, that just being and and knowing like what are some easy wins that we can do to like really raise or raise the bar for, you know, attackers kind of getting into the environment, like really, you know, focuses on key thing, key wins yeah. that he can do or like easy wins that, that make it more difficult. And, and, and he's got good people around him. Yeah. And, and I kind of think too, like he, he deals in this, this kind of this, his mannerism is he's, he's kind of dealing out 
trust and respect as currency. And you just, you know, watching that over the last 10, 12, 13 years, it's just awesome to watch those returns for him on the security side, the business side, and the personal side. Like, I mean, I, I love when, you know, some of the guys at Packet Ninjas, are, you know, pull me in. They're like, hey, you know, like, can you call Joey, you know? <laughs> and Joey fields the call, and, and, you know, like I can say, like, this is, a, this is more than just a, a technical vulnerability, and this is what the team found. Like, this is a business risk. Like, can you translate that, you know? And he does, and it's, it's awesome. You know, he just moves with fluid motion on on stuff that's cool you know absolutely i think for me personally like i started a company called i used to run a consultancy that i worked with you on uh executive instruments and that was kind of our whole goal was to be able to break down complex technical information and have it make sense from the board level perspective like you want to translate technical into business lingo if you will uh, and then bat and vice versa too, right? Like you want to be able to take the business requirements. And this is really one of the key things of success is like really kind of, and I'm talking about now strategically for an InfoSec program is like really being able to understand like what makes the business run, what is the key infrastructure and starting to prioritize your visibility, your detections, your maturity around um, key business objectives. Like what really keeps the lights on? If, if it didn't work tomorrow, what would cause the business to fail? And really kind of wrapping your head around those things and translating that back into technical requirements. Well, so um, I don't know if you know this, Zach, but Brian and I have been s- secretly pushing what we call the Peyton maturity <laughs> model. I, I, I call it the Peyton Martinez security model. Yeah, yeah and, and actually, so <laughs> so I, 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 I've, I've asked people a bunch of times, like when they start asking, like, well, should, we do, should we buy this, you know, whatever tool that, like, it, you know, ends all security issues? I'm like, well, what's your maturity model? <laughs> and they're like, they look at you like, well, what are you talking about? And I'm like, dude, have you heard about the Peyton maturity model? Like, <laughs> this thing has been deployed all over, which I mean, actually it has because we haven't told you about it. We were going to trademark it for you. <laughs> I, I I may have actually done that, but uh... <laughs> see, true friends trademark other friends' ideas for them. <laughs> I, I, and... I made a chart for it. I have a PowerPoint. Uh, there's there's Just a whole a listener. I'll was... back up and tell the. So we were at Riot, and Riot's got huge infrastructure. And so one of the things that my team, I can't just say it was just me, um, you know, that my team kind of <laughs> iteratively came up with, how do we identify what's key to Riot? Because there's a million directions you can go in. You know, compliance always tries to, like, scope things down. And it's kind of a similar approach. You want to scope things down to, like, what's really integral to the business. And really kind of, in each environment, slowly step up, or quickly if you can, step up in the maturity and it kind of starts off like we wanted to be like let's just document what those things are and then let's see do we have any documentation do we know who runs that infrastructure let's just do the basics to like get to know the people in that environment and then slowly ramp it up from like all right we know who those people are do we have logs for them are they well structured are they is their patching plan in place are they firewalled off do we have an understanding of who logs in for and then gradually stepping up the understanding to the point where you know later on you've got come you know, custom detections for it. You've got, you know, maybe you're starting to do things like honeypots, you know, maybe you're even, you know, you're starting to fuzz it on a regular basis. Like there's, there's stuff that you can do. And it, it always depends contextually on like what that right. business, but well, um, I used it last week with a client to explain to them, you know, they were, uh, we're, we're going to, you know, buy this endpoint solution. And I, I knew they didn't have complete log coverage. Or you know, uh, you know, or, or inventory any. controls, <laughs> right? I mean, they, they had some other much lower level on the, on the model chart problems, um, and you know, you can throw up that chart, and they, you know, and then they, they can readily see like, oh, these are the basic things we should have, and here's the tier, you know, level two things, and so on, and you know, they end up working it out for themselves. Oh, maybe, maybe we shouldn't spend on that level four type product when frankly we don't even have a full-time security team so i don't know who's right. going to be monitoring that endpoint product anyway you know and it, but that hadn't occurred to them right because they've been sold this idea of you have to have this super high speed endpoint product and if you don't you don't have a real cybersecurity program it's like that's not the basis of it you know what was that again zach 
Well, I was just saying, I, I blame a lot of times companies will end up in this scenario, especially when they're dealing with payments and stuff, it is compliance initiatives, right? Oh, yeah. like, say you have all this stuff, but don't say you need inventory management, right? It's like, you got to have your fire eye and you got to have your zero day prevention mechanisms and you've got to have, you know, all this crap basically. And then you don't even have the team of people to manage it or monitor it. I mean, I was going to say, it's yeah. like the target problem, right? Like they had fire eye, it detected it, but they didn't have, they weren't mature enough at that time. Now they have an amazing team. Um, yeah, they do. To, to, be able to to just stay on top of those alerts, and and that that's something that again they're putting the cart before the horse, right? Like you don't, you you gotta you gotta crawl before you can walk, and you gotta walk before you can fly. But a lot of people try to fly without even knowing how to crawl when it comes to like security, sure. right? And it, it it having something like the Peyton maturity model or Peyton Martinez maturity model. I call it the Peyton Martinez model now. Okay, I like that. Still PMM. There's still out. PMM. It okay. works very okay. well. So um, uh, we're just going to need to change that trademark really quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, it's, it's, you know, being that I work with so many lawyers, that was an easy fix. Um, <laughs> uh, going back around to what we were just talking about with, with Joey and, and the, the difficulty in translating um, things to the board level and things like that, uh, because I do work with so many attorneys and things like this, uh, we see all the time where, you know, CISO is just not a, a position that gets to talk to the board. Like they just, you know, unless somebody from the board super interested and reaches down and, and trusts that CISO and stuff like that. Um, you know, a often the CIO? a lot of times, you know, you, well, there's very few occasions where a CIO is actually, you know, a board member kind of level position, right? They typically get invited in maybe a couple of times to, to talk to them and things like this. So I end up working with these attorneys who, act as outside lack of a better term cybersecurity professionals which is sort of scary sometimes uh you know where they're advising the board on cybersecurity issues um and and sometimes it's done really well um, yeah yeah you know tara swamanatha at uh, executive cyber law fantastic at doing this because you know backgrounds in, in, in doing that sort of thing and and really understanding it but in other cases you know it's it's focuses heavily around compliance issues and and, and things like this where th then the board gets this kind of missed misguided sort of representation of what's going on on the cybersecurity side or what's what should be important and things like that um but the, there's a there's a difficulty in there right you know how do you explain to board members how important two-factor authentication is but at the same time, you know, talk to them about the larger idea of, of, of the PMM, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and, and both are, you know, like, hey, 2FA is something we should be doing right now. We could do this like really low cost and easy. But we also need to talk about the larger you know, strategy for the organization. You know, well, I mean, I think some of that, too, is like folks need to be setting those long those those expectations that i mean that's a sign of a leader they're showing like where we are right now and where we're gonna go tomorrow right, right. and pushing that to a board i mean i'm on a board and i'll i'll admit like there's a, like i don't need to get down into the details like on a budget or on certain things i need to know a percentage and i need to know like where things are going yeah. Is it good or bad? Like we have, a, you, you have like an hour time to do a board meeting, right? Like you're going through a lot of topics and, and maybe it's longer for some people or not, but what if you're on five boards? Like, you know, like you need, you need like direction, percentage, what it's going to solve, what the problem is. Cool. It's either a good idea or a bad idea. You know, like, yeah, it's, it's quick facts, you know? So I'd love to see more engagement at the board level with cybersecurity insurance agencies. I think coming to them with like actual business risk percentages and, and actuarial data, I think is something that could help a lot. Yeah. I've been paying a lot of attention to, I mean, and they've been making plays too, right? Like wasn't the, co wasn't, wasn't the company that bought immunity sec, Dave Vitell's company, a cybersecurity insurance company. Yep. And I mean, they're, uh, they're a purchasing really great talent, right? You know, Aon bought uh, Straws Freeberg. You know, so yeah, there's, there's a, um, actually speaking of Joey Johnson, we were two weeks ago, he and I were up in New York uh, at Columbia University at the uh, symposium on law and cyber, uh, cyber warfare. And they had both the, uh, the head of underwriting for cybersecurity for AIG 
Chubb, and then they had two uh, two big, um, uh, what do you want to call them? Uh, firms that actually sell the stuff, uh, Marsh and, uh, and, and Axis there uh, with, with their products, uh, you know, talking about the implementation and the, the kind of confusion in the industry right now, you know, it, it, most companies for what's actually covered by cybersecurity versus what isn't, but, you know, what's covered by their other, you know, liability policies for this and that. And, uh, and uh, you know, the lawsuits that have sprung out of that because, People mistakenly, you know, don't don't understand what their cyber coverage is for. Uh, things like this, so they assume they, you know, they got sold something, and, and then the, the company's just trying to run off with their money and and things like this. Where, yeah, you know, it's there's there's a lot of well, one, it's not a very mature field of insurance, right? It's you know maybe twenty years old, uh, but but just. Uh, you know, again, going back to the compliance thing, people are like, "Oh, we got to have cybersecurity insurance." Check the box, but then they're they're not really sure what's covered. Under but that, but right? let's just like break it down to insurance, right? Like that's a pretty painful process within a business, you know? Like oh yeah, like I, I hate mean, it because I'm just like, man, just tell me exactly like in a high level like. What's covered, what's not covered, and under what what circumstance? I don't want to spend time reading fifty pages of your documents. Like, I need an umbrella well, and, insurance policy for all these companies, and I want to make sure this is like super and, good. And that's I want to write a check, and I want to get out of the door. Like, I hate this. It's like dealing with marketing people, right? Like, yeah, that, that's like, what the brokers at Marsh and, and Access were talking about. Was you know actually doing a matrix of you know here's here's your different insurance policies. And on this level of things that can happen to you, here's what covers what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that you could basically just go down the list, and they'd be like, "Yep, that one covers this, 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 this." And you get down there and be like, "And this thing." And they're like, "Oh, we don't, we don't have anything there." Like, nope. Unfortunately, you, you know, the policies you have right now don't cover these three things. Are these important to you or not? You know, but uh, you know, to, to, to try and help people understand that. Was there any mention of insurance companies like adjusting their premiums based on, you know, something like a PMM or like, if you do this, you know, if you apply to a fan, everything will drop your premium. That's what I'd like to see is a more incentive based approach. Yeah. So there was some talk from the underwriters about, you know, like, look, the industry is definitely going to have to go that way um, because, you know, we're, we're getting hit with more and larger, you know, uh, claims against those policies. Um and, you know, and they talked about situations where, look, you know, we, we didn't cover this this particular claim because the client basically misrepresented the, the security of their their organization. Right. We have this whole form for them to fill out. We have this. You have that. You have these other things. They, yes, 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 yes. Then the breach happens. They make their claim and come to find out, well, you didn't you didn't have any of that stuff, which I mean technically is insurance fraud <laughs> but yeah, um yeah. we're not going to get technical with it but you know you know so, so there's there's also some of that going on right where you know in, in the rush to to get a cybersecurity policy on board so you can you know check off a compliance checklist you, you didn't really make sure you had some of the underpinning requirements of that policy in place right sad panda i know whoop, whoop, whoop. yeah well, guys, we're gonna have to wrap this up, but we should uh, we should have another follow up at some point, and um, we will. Zach, no nice word. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, this is great. This is we'll we will probably publish this at you know sometime in the next few months, and um, okay. we'll we'll we let you know and everything, and it'll be sliced and diced and packaged and polished and. We'll, we will all be awesome. <laughs> Shiny. There'll be, there'll be cool shadow dragon like things going on behind us. On the outro, I just want to give a couple shout outs if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So first, to my girl Slice. Um, I also want to talk real quickly uh, to you two, um, but also to, about my man John Threat, uh, who was one of the original Masters of Hackers, um, is getting ready to throw together a movie that's like cyberpunk in nature. He's, he's kickstarting it, so it's all crowdfunded, but. Uh, yeah, he's going to do something called Memory Thieves, where it's this whole, you know, 2048 Los Angeles is like 
totally dystopian future and like in order to get back they got to steal the memories of these wealthy people to like remember the secret to humanity it's going to be a really interesting kind of project um so i'm, I'm excited about that and uh yeah and to my business partner carl man's the beast but also to cyber war dog and and colin it's any bit and you know, right yeah we should mention cyber war dog so uh that that ossem uh that we're talking about that's the actually uh open source security events metadata and you can find that on github at hunters dash forge ossem um with uh there's links there to uh to uh to roberto rodriguez cyber war dog and, and his stuff and his twitter feed and all that sort of stuff yeah, that guy's really pushing it forward. He's got something called the Mordor data set where they're basically like collecting data set from real world APT groups uh, and allowing you to replay that telemetry. It kind of blends into like, the, you know, the MITRE stuff and, and being able to have like attack testing, like unit testing attacks against your infrastructure to make sure that you're able to detect them. Yeah, which is uh, very so cool. In the future, yeah. We didn't even get into any of that stuff, but uh, maybe next time. But uh, yeah, he's really kind of pushing it on that. And, the, and yeah, so thank you. I nice, nice. Well, guys, this is awesome. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Right. Talk to you all later.